The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with us all. In his name, welcome to the Parish Church of St Columba. We extend a particularly warm welcome to everyone worshipping at home. And now may we in silence prepare for the worship of Almighty God. Let us worship God. We have gathered in this community of love and care from many places, bringing varied experiences and thoughts. We pause together now, allowing divine presence to embrace us, letting the cares of the outside world relax their grip. Let us pray. Space and time are a gift to reflect upon our presence in the universe, to give thanks for all small moments which make our lives special and unique, recognising occasions where divine love is present, awake to God in our being, God present in our struggles and joys, our hidden places of fear and shame, in our sorrow and disappointment. We acknowledge with regret moments we have been less than we would wish, times when we forget the divine within ourselves, within others. Yet we can find strength and courage to be affirmed by God in these moments, so that our hearts and minds are opened that we might see divine love working around us, for that recognition may lighten our burdens and we may be filled with the Spirit to bring grace, compassion and hope ourselves to those places where it is needed. We give thanks that God meets us where we are, moving aside feelings of inadequacy, 
overturning misplaced dependencies and opening windows of light and hope. God, who threw stars into the sky, remaining within us, ever beckoning us onwards in faith, as we follow Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our lesson today is taken from the Gospel of St Mark at chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered round him, and he was by the lake. Then one of the leaders of the synagogue named Jairus came, and when he saw him, fell at his feet and begged him repeatedly, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well and live. So he went with him. And a large crowd followed him and pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had endured much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. And she was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. For she said, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. Immediately her hemorrhage stopped and she felt in her body that she had been healed of her disease. Immediately aware that power had gone forth from him, Jesus turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing in on you. How can you say, Who touched me? He looked all around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling, fell down before him, and told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, some people came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the leader of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. He allowed no one to follow him except Peter, James and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the leader of the synagogue, he saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. When he had entered, he said to them, Why do you make a commotion and weep? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. Then he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, get up. And immediately the girl got up and began to walk about she was 12 years of age. As this, at this, they were overcome with amazement. He strictly ordered them to tell no one. No one should know about this. And they told him, told them to give her some food. Amen. Thank you. 
Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side. This is a simple but poignant beginning. He had left the Gentile country of the Gerasenes, where he had healed the demoniac and returned to the more Jewish side of Lake Galilee. In that opening verse, seemingly a mere detail, we learn that Jesus moved between two vastly different religious worlds, Gentile and Jew. More than this, for me, the symbolism of the shore, the shifting, fluctuating boundary of water and land, suggests a touching of two worlds, eternity and time. Jesus embodied this union. With no more than 11 words, Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side. The Gospel writer imaginatively suggests a broader theme of worlds meeting. In the drama of our lesson, we hear of a desperate father, a dying daughter, a hemorrhaging woman, a healing, and incredibly, a resurrection of the dead. In our interpretation of scripture, we need continually to be careful and discerning. Rather than be dazzled by miraculous events, by a literal reading of Bible stories, we are invited to journey beneath the surface, into the story, and listen with the ear of the heart. It is also true that if our faith rests solely on magical miracles, where does that leave us when such miracles do not happen? In my first parish, and as a hospital chaplain, I was called to the bed of a young man on a life support machine. The nurse had told me that the prognosis was not good. The couple had three children, and she asked me to pray for him. Like anyone would, she made promises to God about the future, if only her partner would recover. The young man was a prisoner who had collapsed in jail. In tears, her partner told me that he loved his children. He was a good father and was not a bad man. In prayer, I asked for God's healing of the man. Such a bedside was no place to discuss theology. What did I believe? was possible. The former Bishop of Durham, the late David Jenkins, provocatively said that miracles were cruel because they made those whose cancers did not get healed feel unloved as well as ill. What are we to make of our Gospel lesson this morning? Did you notice that the hemorrhaging woman had bled for 12 years and the young girl who died was 12 years old? In the Jewish tradition, the tradition of Jesus, 12 is symbolic of the entire people of Israel. It had been 12 tribes that had left Egypt and made their way to the Promised Land. Twelve signifies the salvation and healing of the enslaved Hebrew people. It is no coincidence that Jesus chose twelve disciples. In one sense, our Gospel lesson is about the salvation and healing of an oppressed nation. Salvation means healing. Perhaps the woman in this story is Israel. Her blood, the life force, and the physicians who attended to her, the kings, foreign rulers, and religious leaders who had failed her. 
Did the Gospel writer believe Jesus to be the one to heal Israel's wounds? How do you interpret the story? We may interpret the story in a personal sense. The woman thought to herself, if I but touch his clothes, I will be made well. It is not that Jesus radiated spiritual healing power or wore some magical suit. Her thought was more basic than that. As a woman, she considered herself unworthy of a rabbi's attention. And as a woman in her condition, she was socially considered impure and continuously unclean. She dared not defile a holy man. In desperation, she sought to touch secretly the hem of his garment and be healed. She feared that, like others, Jesus would find her touch disgusting. In part, then, this tender gospel story is about the agony of personal suffering. Suffering inside, the suffering of isolation, humiliation, and perhaps self-loathing. The Archbishop of Westminster, the late Cardinal Basil Hume, said that in his pastoral experience, people are sick rather than sinful. He wrote of the sicknesses that gnaw away at us, thwarted ambition, resentment, frustration, wounds inflicted by other people, the pain that comes from feeling unappreciated, disliked, rejected, or being the subject of harsh, unfair criticism. These are the inner wounds that fester away. Perhaps for a moment, we may be that hemorrhaging woman with our own inner wounds, we may share human brokenness. Jesus listened to her, spoke with her, and said her faith had made her well. Crossing the chasms of male and female, clean and unclean, Jesus united two vastly different worlds. In Greek, though not obviously in English, there is a difference between healing and cure. In approaching Jesus, the woman had sought healing. On touching his garment, she felt herself cured inside. Jesus then told her that her faith had healed her. Healing is more than cure. It is wholeness, peacefulness, and contentment. In facing an illness or one's death, we can be made whole, gain a sense of peace without being cured. It is healing Jesus brings to us more often than cure. Both our stories today have female characters at the centre. Adding to the list of taboos that Jesus had already broken, we almost don't notice that as a rabbi deemed unclean by the touch of a hemorrhaging woman, he entered the home of a synagogue leader. At the girl's bedside, Jesus broke another prohibition, the prohibition on touching a dead body. Finally, as the climax of the story, Jesus raised her to life. Perhaps once again, we may enter the narrative, become the lifeless child, let our souls be touched by the hand of Christ and be raised to newness of life. May we feel his nearness and that inner rising when raised, she was given something to eat. After resurrection, 
something to eat? Is that an image, a hint of the heavenly banquet? Jesus crossed the greatest chasm of all, death and life. We may read these stories in different ways, at different levels. To me, they are poetry, not science, faith narrative, not history. We are to experience these stories. The divine dwells within us. The miracle is here, in the heart. In Judaism, it is said of prayer that the question is not whether God is listening to our prayers, but whether we are listening to them ourselves. The change, the growth is in us. Jesus told the hemorrhaging women, your faith, your faith, your openness, your spiritual searching, your hunger for God has made you well. What do you hear in these stories? Amen. Late sunsets and early sunrises, overcast and clear skies, parks and golf courses green and lush, garden birds and waders, fresh sea breezes and scenic countryside, peacefulness and serenity. We are blessed beyond measure, God's book of nature lies open before us. Holy God, we thank you for the insights of others, the gift and therapy of friendship, the thoughtfulness of neighbours, the companionship of pets and the love of family. We are blessed also by the support of this loving community, for the poetry and unfathomable depths of scripture, the healing light of Jesus, and the shared effort of service. Bless our country, O God, our Queen and leaders. May public life be shaped by service, integrity, compassion and wisdom. We pray for peace across the world, peace in our communities, and peace in our hearts. May there be ever greater understanding, sharing and respect between peoples, where diversity in the human family is celebrated, not feared, 
and our common humanity is treasured, not diminished. Bless each one of us on our continuing journey of discovery, discovery of self, of life and of God. God of wholeness and healing, we lift up before you those who are suffering, others and maybe ourselves, those tortured by memories of hurt, shame or a sense of failure, those trapped in false hopes and unrealistic dreams and those facing the very real pain of loneliness. We are called to be Easter Christians in a Good Friday world. In all the endings and hardships we endure, may there be new beginnings, light in our darkness, hope in our despair. May we know the touch of Christ. In silence, we lay before you the welcome burdens of love which we carry on our hearts. God of the living, we do give thanks for the saints, martyrs and mystics who in generations past shaped the church of today, giving it life and witnessing to Christ. We pray also for our loved ones departed, friends and family, those who are alive in your nearer presence, reborn in life beyond this life. These prayers we offer in Jesus' name. And in his words, we would sum up all our prayers, saying together, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen.
The blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be upon you now and remain with you always. Amen.